like to welcome you to 1964 Alumni Day. Say how pleased we are that many of you chose to join us on this occasion. For some time, Dr. Linson and the rest of us have been interested in doing something a little special with Alumni Day, which precedes commencement, uh, taking the idea that people who graduated from Ball State Teachers College are pleased with the notion that whenever they come back to the college, they can learn something new. Whenever you come back to the college, you can see new buildings, you can see new faces, uh, but we hope that over and above that, you'll have an opportunity to be in discussions and to learn something. In different years, we've tried different approaches to attain this goal. This year, uh, a quite radically different approach has been suggested. I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that uh, people at the college have been discussing the desirability of changing the name of the institution from Ball State Teachers College to Ball State University. And as we consider this option, it uh, seemed to several people that it would be desirable to think about what this type of act really meant to the development of the institution. It seemed like a good time to look back and see if we could identify the strengths of the operation that we wanted to be sure to preserve, and at the same time look forward to see those directions that would be most fruitful uh, for us to pursue. And with that in mind, uh, these three gentlemen have been asked to be a panel to address themselves to this topic. What was Ball State Teachers College like while you were here? What are the things that you remember that you believe gave it strength? What are the directions in which you think we might go in the future? In order to prompt their thinking and to give them a little support for the conclusions that they might present, on the 30th of April, the alumni office sent out a questionnaire to uh, many members of the association and ask them these same questions. What do you remember about Ball State Teachers College with pleasure, with pride? What are the things that you think we ought to stress in the future? So in addition to their own ideas, uh, they have yours to rely on. We thought it might be interesting to uh, see what a good sample we have today. How many of you who are here in this room today uh, received one of these questionnaires, filled it out, and returned it? Well, that's a reasonable sample. <laughs> Good. We'll talk uh, then about this questionnaire and about the ideas that uh, the men with me here have. You can tell if you've got your good glasses on uh, who these people are, but uh, let me uh, call them off. On, on the end of the table, we have Dr. Collins Burnett, class 35, professor of higher education at the Ohio State University. Uh, next to him, Dr. Everett Light, class of 34, superintendent of Washington Township, Indianapolis, Indiana. And next to me, Dr. Fred Armstrong, 41, senior staff member of the United States Steel Foundation. I don't know uh, to what extent the other members of the panel brought their own steering divisions, but I think it's real smart of you, Fred, to have invited your mother and father and your brother to be here and everything that you say will be a plus. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some others. <laughs> Let me just say a word about the, uh, about the questionnaire by way of introduction. The figures that these gentlemen are going to refer to represent uh, an accumulation of about 30% of a questionnaire response that was sent to about 2,000 people. About 50% of the alumni responded to this, but the time permitted tabulation of only 30%. We were interested to note that uh, as we divided the uh, questionnaires into four categories, those people who uh, graduated from the institution before 1935, 36 to 45, 46 to 55, 56 to the present. But about 10% of the responses came from that first group. 
the people who graduated before 1935. And if we add up all the people who graduated from Ball State Teachers College and divide them up, there were 12% of all of our degrees were awarded before that date. So that's a pretty good response from that group. If you take the period 36 to 45, that's the next 10 years, 11% of the responses come from that group, and 13 or almost 14% of our degrees were awarded at that time in that period. Our next period, 46 to 55, accounts for 27% of the questionnaires and about 30% of the degrees come from that period. And the last period, 1966 to 1964, accounts for just over 50% of our questionnaire responses. And this accounts for about 43% or 44% of all of our degrees. So in the first three categories, we have a very good distribution, we think, a very good representation of uh, our graduates. It's in the last category that we have more uh, than any other time. So perhaps these responses are a little heavily weighted uh, in the direction of the most recent graduates. Well, I could go on and say some more things about the questionnaire, but uh, the way we decided we'd operate this panel is to ask each member to say a few things about some of the categories that we've used here. The first one is personal data, the second is Ball State in the future, the third is teacher preparation, and so on. And we've asked each member of the panel to take one or more of these areas and develop it a little bit and then add his personal idea. With that in mind, let me turn uh, to Dr. Armstrong, uh, excuse me, Dr. Burnett. Uh, who's going to tell us how he views the responses to this questionnaire and what he thinks uh, about the uh, Ball State Teachers College as reflected by these data. Tom? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. We didn't ask you uh, ahead of time, Dean Burkhardt, if we could throw in a couple of ad libs from time to time, but... You may. All right. Um, I wanted to mention that um, this seems to be the time of year to learn about uh, alumni self-studies because on the way over this morning, I happened to pick up a copy of the Springfield, Ohio paper and found that Barnard College has just recently completed a self-study of their some 13,000 women alumni. Barnard, you know, is the undergraduate college at uh, Columbia University. And I'm not trying to compare uh, Barnard with Ball State uh, there might be several differences. But uh, anyhow, the important point is that uh, Barnard has done the same thing that Ball State has done. And in the first paragraph of this news story uh, is a kind of uh, short profile of what the Barnard uh, alumna looks like. And here's the quote. She's married to a professional man who makes more than $10,000 a year. She has two children and she used to work in education. Well, uh, who knows, maybe we'll find some information from our alumni study that will resemble that uh, paragraph profile of the Barnard graduate. Uh, I tried to think of some jokes and stories about um, uh, alumni and about uh, colleges, but you know that's awfully hard to do especially when you're uh, talking in the midst of your own uh, college alumni group. But I do recall a, a story that's attributed to uh, former President Bryan when he was president of Indiana University. It seems that uh, he was walking across the campus one day and um, an alumnus came up to him and said, um, President Bryan, how does it happen that every year Indiana University seems to graduate so many fools? President Bryan said, why, uh, the answer is easy. Every year we take in so many. <laughs> well, I don't think that applies to Ball State, but uh, I thought you'd like to hear that story about Indiana anyhow. <laughs> I uh, asked one of our students the other day um, at Ohio State how he would define a college, and he said, well, he had read one place sometime or other that a college is a place where pebbles are polished and diamonds are dimmed. 
and I uh, wasn't sure whether he was referring to uh, our institution over there in Columbus or, uh, or what he had in mind. Um, then another student came in one day and said, uh, uh, said I thought you'd like to know that uh, I'm a submarine student. Well, I had never heard that term before, and I asked him what he meant by that. He said, I'm below sea level. <laughs> and he was, because the next quarter he was dismissed. <laughs> well, um, this first section of the um, alumni self-study deals with personal data. And I think um, I have just a few comments about it that uh, may interest you. Um, since the uh, sample of some 2,000 of the approximately 25,000 alumni of Ball State uh, was picked on the basis of most of them being graduates, it's not at all a surprise to find in the first two answers that almost 95% uh, who responded were graduates. In fact, I just wondered how it happened that the seven slipped in there who had to answer and say they were not graduates, but I'm sure that's not an important point. Um, approximately 4.6% have master's degrees from uh, Ball State and 1.5% PhD degrees. And that's not to be wondered at in as much as um, um, Ball State started offering the master's degree only as recently as 1935. And since that was the year that Ball State let me go, I got out in that year. That's the way uh, people who leave certain institutions refer to them now. Uh, I got out in 1935. Um, I remember that man who got that first master's degree. He went up to Alaska in the Matanuska Valley. And I thought it was very appropriate to, for him to get the first master's degree. I thought afterwards that it might have been better if he could have taken three or four more degrees along with him. I'm sure uh, he needed them up there. And then in 1952, we gave the first PhD degree. So. Uh, inasmuch as uh, a fairly large number of uh, alumni in this sample were from recent uh, years, uh, you'd expect the number of advanced degrees to be small. I would just make a guess uh, to members of the panel here that if this same study were to be done 10 years from now, in 1974, we would find a fairly high percentage of uh, alumni going on for MA and PhD degrees. And by the way, on another point, um, there is another uh, doctor's degree, you know. Um, we refer just to a PhD, but there could be something else. Uh, that isn't offered, I guess, here at the present time, but maybe it, it could be. Well, uh, about the distribution of sex, here we have an advantage over Barnard College because uh, they didn't even have to raise that question. They were just talking about 13,000 women. And uh, certainly no one wants to um, belittle the importance of women, but I'm sure the um, uh, female members of the alumni group, the alumni, would say that it was pretty nice to have some of the men around here. I'm not sure how they feel about that. I always felt that way on the other side of it. It was awfully nice to have a lot of girls on the campus. In fact, uh, Fred Armstrong and I were talking, and we thought that there were about, uh, oh, maybe twice as many women as there were men when we were students here. Maybe uh, I felt that way because um, it just seemed to me that there were women every place. And since then, I've learned literally that women have gotten every place, <laughs> even up in space and in all the professions and all the different areas. So uh, anyhow, this dis distribution was 44% male and 56% uh, approximately uh, women. Then another important and interesting item uh, asked the alumni to indicate their current residence. Well, you might want to know that about 72% are still living in Indiana. This is Delaware County, county adjoining Delaware, and some other county in Indiana. 72% of the 655 alumni who responded <coughs> to this questionnaire are living in Indiana. 9.1% in a state adjoining Indiana, and I'm sure I checked that one when I answered the, uh, the survey, and about 19% in another state. Now, somebody could raise the question, is it positive or negative? 
for such a uh, significant number of uh, our graduates to stay in Indiana. Maybe uh, somebody could argue it would be better if our graduates went to another part of the country. Why don't we send a lot of people to California and Florida and New York State and Connecticut and New Hampshire and so on? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's just because uh, people who grew up in Indiana like to stay in Indiana. They leave high school at um, um, Marion or Muncie or Anderson or wherever and come to Ball State, finish their work, and then stay on uh, in Indiana. So uh, maybe somebody could be real nasty and say this indicates a certain conservatism, a bit of provincialism, and Ball State graduates just don't move. They don't migrate to other parts of the country. Well, um, maybe this is uh, a good indication. At least in terms of benefit to the state of Indiana, someone could argue, the graduates of Ball State uh, give uh, good dividends because most of them tend to stay right here in Indiana and teach and uh, do other kinds of uh, leadership uh, jobs in the, uh, in the community. Well, um, I don't know. If somebody disagrees, please come in on it because I'm sure uh, there'll be plenty of chance for you to disagree. Uh, another item, what is your, you, your and your spouse's present occupation? Well, about 50% uh, of the responding group said teaching. And uh, of that group, about 12.4% said their spouse was also teaching. The next largest uh, percentage was uh, housewives. 17.1% said that they were engaged as housewives. Um, oh, let's see one or two others. College teacher, 3%. College administrator, 1%. Professional, MD, another, about 7%. Um, I guess that's about all I have to say on that first part, unless somebody wants mm -hmm. to argue with um, some item. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's mm -hmm. a good outline. Uh, unless you want to say something about no, the no. Well, let's uh, move on. I thought what we might do is go through some of these questions very quickly, not to bore you with a whole lot of statistics, and then come back and have uh, <coughs> more personal statements uh, that haven't come out up to that point. And then, of course, we want you to ask questions of, uh, of the panel and to make some statements of your own, because these are not the only people who have some ideas about the college. Uh, each of you has, I'm sure. According to our lineup, our next speaker ought to be Dr. Fred Armstrong. Fred, do you want to speak? Thank you. I haven't brought a story, and I'm sure that Colin's stories will uh, more than do for the rest of the panel. And I will go ahead with a portion of this survey. Uh, then I think it will be useful for us all to try to come back and uh, uh, redefine its meaning. Uh, pick out the larger ideas as possible. But section two of the survey is perhaps one of the more significant because it has to do with Ball State and the future of concern to all of us. And uh, th indeed, this first question is uh, Ball State Teachers College should change its name to Ball State University. This perhaps is the most pregnant question in the whole uh, questionnaire. And I think the answer is provided would be about, as you might guess, uh, the respondents had <coughs> five graded choices, and 31% uh, uh, of them said they strongly agree that it should be known as Ball State University. Another 31% simply agreed. This makes a, a clear majority saying yes. And for about one quarter of the respondents, uh, it didn't make much difference one way or the other to them. And uh, only about 15% disagreed or strongly disagreed. So there would seem, seem to be a mandate among alumni for becoming a university. Now, this simply says change its name to Ball State University. And of course, it doesn't say what is a university or what would Ball State University be. But it's, it, it's not now. And I don't know the answers to these questions. I think the administration would like to hear opinions from all of us about this. Um, in my own view, 
had this question been asked in 1938 or in almost any year, I think the response very likely would have been quite similar. Uh, people would say, yes, it would be nice if it were a university. And uh, my impression has been through many of these intervening years that uh, uh, Ball State and its trustees had been dedicated to becoming the very best possible teacher's college. And in my view, it has done that. And now this does constitute a, a considerable change in the route of this institution in the future. Uh, I, I would have more to say about the whole concept of Ball State as a university uh, later on. But to get on with responses uh, you people have made to the question, uh, another looks ahead to 1975 and asks you whether Ball State should be an outstanding institution over what geographical region. Uh, only 2 or 3% thought principally serving East Central Indiana, 22% uh, serving all of Indiana, 37% serving the Middle West, and 39% rendering service national in scope. Uh, so that we have, again, a majority of people uh, looking beyond the, well beyond the borders of Indiana as the service area, so to speak, of both states. Now, this, I think, is also comparable to the role of many institutions, public institutions of about this size. We know that uh, nationally, uh, only 25% of college students cross the state boundary to go to college. And this would seem roughly parallel to that kind of uh, statistic. Uh, I do think it holds implications for what I understand is uh, a problem in Indiana and in all states, uh, and that is what should be the philosophy of the state, of the citizens of the state, concerning encouraging students to come in from other states or discouraging them. And this can be done, of course, by the amount of tuition differential there is between the home citizen student and the out-of-state student. Um, this seems to be moving in different directions around the country in a very interesting way. The, uh, perhaps the most extreme uh, movement that I know about going on now is in the state of Virginia, where there is a strong movement in the state legislature to exclude entirely uh, students who are not native Virginians at the University of Virginia. Now, they're being strongly discouraged from this view by their own University of Virginia, its faculty and administration, and by educational leaders from other states. And I doubt if it ever really happens, but there may be a compromise in which the tuition is raised so high as to, in effect, discourage other students. And in this instance, the University of Virginia is one of our very old and, uh, in many ways, uh, distinguished institutions, and it may well wither on the vine if it uh, cannot go beyond its own boundaries. And in my view, <coughs> when an institution wants to become uh, of national and in these days international significance, it is almost bound to find whatever ways it can to break down barriers uh, of discouraging persons to cross state lines to come to us. Or in effect, I would hope that uh, a strong tuition differential would not be maintained. Um, we, we do have an ac academic exchange uh, throughout our culture. There, <coughs> there are several states in the West with uh, no medical schools. And uh, so this means that uh, neighboring states must provide the, uh, the training of the doctors who serve in those states. And similarly, there is no school of architecture in Indiana, so somebody else is paying for the in part the education of the architects we have. Uh, so no state can live within itself, and uh, I think this has important implications for both states. Um, just one other point on this matter. Um, I learned some three or four years ago what to me was a very interesting fact. I think it's unique to Indiana. 
uh, that there had been a decision among all of the college presidents of Indiana, private and public colleges, to, to in the future try to divide evenly between public and private institutions the future freshman classes of all the colleges. That is, half the students in Indiana would go to public institutions, half to private. Well, this decision, if it is in effect, if it still is in effect, it's a rather amazing thing because the proportion nationally, as you know, is, is moving rather rapidly. In 1948, we passed the point where half the students were in private institutions and half in public. Now, just a little bit over 40 percent are in private. Uh, Sidney Picton of the Ford Foundation predicts that by 1970, this will be 30 percent. By 1980, we'll be down to 20 percent in the private institutions. So if Indiana does continue with this 50-50 relationship, you see it will be in a somewhat uh, unique situation. Another question, <coughs> what responsibility would you like to see Ball State accept <coughs> in the field of continuing education for alumni? And here there is a rather even distribution of responses among the choices. Uh, a slight edge, about 43 percent, uh, wanted Ball State to provide academic programs for alumni in my regional area. Now, I'm sure that this will please and offer a challenge to uh, Dr. Linson and his work. I'm a little uh, nonplussed, too, by the fact that uh, the respondents rather heavily favor that, uh, because in another <coughs> question, there may be represented a somewhat disparate view uh, when asked uh, what activities in your life do you find uh, give you the most satisfaction. The one at the very bottom of the list of nine uh, was participation in study groups, eight tenths of one percent. Now, I don't know whether they like to think <coughs> that they would like to have more education, but uh, don't really enjoy it very much. I remember many years ago Dr. Painter having said that education was among the few things that we pay for so dearly and try so hard not to get. <laughs> <laughs> and this may be related. Uh, Forty-one percent uh, felt a service would be uh, reviews of major articles concerning uh, one's field of study in the alumnus magazine. And in, on many campuses the alumni magazine is becoming a a principal intellectual vehicle uh, for bringing the uh, entire student body and alumni body closer together. 38% uh, uh, <coughs> looked for a supply of current lists of outstanding publications in his major field, a very logical and reasonable choice. And uh, somewhat fewer were interested in uh, a broadcast of educational TV programs. Uh, and uh, the provision of academic programs for alumni on campus as opposed to in one's own region. Now, just two or three other items before I let you pass on to someone else. Um, as to the interest alumni have in helping uh, to recruit students from our youth for uh, Ball State, 48 percent have said that um, uh, if a promising high school student uh, had asked you to recommend a school to him, you would recommend Ball State. Forty-eight percent would if this were a boy. If this were a girl who asked you, sixty-four percent of you would recommend Ball State. So you, you seem perhaps to view it as more suitable for a girl than for a boy. This may have some relationship to uh, the view in our culture, perhaps, that teaching is a, a more suitable career for a girl than for a boy, or a more common career, perhaps, for a girl and a boy. And uh, very few said that they would not recommend Ball State. And then the question came a little closer to home, would you send your own youngster to Ball State? And uh, it appears that you would be a little more ready to send somebody else's youngster to the ball space than your own. Um, as I said, you would uh, send 64% of young girls to ball space, or rather 64% of you would send to somebody else's young girl. Only 49% of you would send your own girl to ball space. And uh, 
37 with friends your son and uh, of course there's a slightly higher percentage of people who probably would not send their own children to Ball State and I should think that this may well reflect the thing we know so well about American life, the social mobility uh, that so often the, the teacher is, um, he may be a child of a first or second generation American, he may be the first to uh, go to college in his family, and teaching opened a wonderful door for him, and now that that door is open, he perhaps would like a larger door <coughs> open for his own child. This may be perhaps why uh, fewer of those who have had the experience would uh, want to do precisely the same for their own children. How selective should Ball State be in their admissions of students? And here, again, is a crucial question. Um, the largest group, well, there were two rather large uh, group answers here. 37 uh, percent believe that uh, you should take only the top half. Now, very few thought you should take only the academically gifted, only about 1 percent of you. Only 7 percent uh, take only the top one fourth. So, as I say, 37 percent would take the top one half. 38 percent take all who are graduates of accredited high schools, which, in effect, is the situation now. And a few had some other ideas about it. Um, this, as I say, seems a crucial question. Uh, the state institutions in many other states have been able to make the transition from having to accept all high school uh, graduates, whether they're vocational, commercial, uh, academic, uh, whether they have a uh, B minus average or whatever. Um, it may constitute a considerable waste of human resources to admit those people who we are relatively certain cannot be successful and uh, then let attrition take care of this problem. Um, I feel sure college administrators may not feel very comfortable under the rules uh, with which they have to operate by uh, legislative fiat. But uh, other states are making changes and I think there will be uh, changes taking place in this state toward uh, 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 accepting the more able academically. And then, of course, it does leave us all with the problem of how to help these less able students. Um, I, in my view, this is an, evit an inevitable direction uh, that this and most public institutions will take. And uh, then the last question, which I'd speak to you now, did you prepare to be a teacher? 91% uh, of the respondents had prepared to be a teacher. Uh, in interestingly, the proportion of the class of 1964 of all states uh, having prepared to be a teacher is 82% or somewhat less. So we see this leavening taking place of people with other majors. I think I've talked far too long about these several <coughs> questions in Berkeley. Well, you had some pretty significant questions. This next to the last one you talked about is a, certainly a fundamental social issue as to who shall be educated and uh, who's expense. And probably we'll come back to that before we're through. Thank you for that analysis. Uh, Everett, would you tell us a little bit about these questions that have to do with teacher preparation? Be a pleasure, sir. As you know, my business is that of uh, managing a school system. And uh, I can honestly say with, uh, for the last 19 years, <clears throat> it's been a pleasure to recruit teachers from Ball State Teachers College on a personal basis because of the opportunity to come back and renew acquaintances. And uh, one area that I'm convinced of is that Ball State as an institution sincerely <coughs> has attempted to do a quality job in teacher preparation. I feel very strongly that if as we go to a new university, and the indication here is that now only 80 percent, 
plan to teach would be one indication as to why you should go to a university. It may get to the place where it will be less than half. But I would hope uh, for the welfare of our state and country that the College of Education bend every effort as it becomes a part of a big university to keep the quality of teacher preparation high. Now, you'll fail as a university, I believe, if you don't do this. <coughs> uh, another reason that, uh, that it's been my pleasure to watch and be associated with Ball State, uh, we in the business of public education today are concerned <coughs> because our taxpayers are concerned about entrance into college. And I happen to be in a community at present where a high percentage attend college, uh, something like 75 or 80 percent. We graduated Tuesday night a class of 701 of uh, which about 80% uh, plan to go on to college. And when all the colleges talk about taking the only, the only, the upper 10% or the upper half with the state institutions, uh, what are you going to do when you get in this lower 20%? Well, uh, there is some merit, seems to me, <coughs> in America that a student should have an opportunity to fail. And Ball State is thus far providing this opportunity. Uh, the spiritual side of man we know very little about. And I'd be interested to know how many of these people that are, in, that are admitted on probation succeed and get a college degree. I'm sure there are some. Stephen, is that right? Okay. Sure there are some. So uh, this is a map. <coughs> Uh, as a test to my belief of this institution's uh, worthiness, I suspect our school, I think last year, sent something like 40 people here. And I believe this year it'll be maybe 60 or more. I'm not sure. But we do send proportionately. I think Indiana was talking with Elvis Starr recently, and we send last year, I think, to IU, 125. And I suspect this year it'll be 150 or more. Uh, so uh, these, this, this business of, of uh, public education, both on the secondary level and then on the college level, is real uh, uh, significant to the superintendent of schools. It's in the process of college preparation. <coughs> Uh, another reason that uh, I'm particularly interested is uh, and, and to show you what I think of the institution. I have a daughter here preparing to be a teacher. Uh, I didn't answer the questionnaire, though, Dean. <laughs> <laughs> didn't give me a chance. Next time. <laughs> uh, the question under teacher preparation I, prepare, I prepared for teaching but never taught because of, and there were 113 answers to this question, and as you would expect, other business, marriage, military service took up the majority, almost uh, 75 percent. Ten percent said unattractiveness of the profession. Maybe some other profession was more attractive. Maybe it ought to have been sta stated positively. <coughs> uh, I feel strongly the importance, of course, of, of uh, the teaching profession as a part of, of American life and the necessity if we are to maintain uh, the free enterprise system. And I hope, uh, I feel very strongly we need the best people in it, the best people. Uh, if our community, if our community is sending 50 this year, uh, I hope it's part of the reason they're coming is because they're impressed with the teachers they've been having the last 
eight or ten years of their lives. <clears throat> uh, another question, have I taught more or less, uh, I have taught more or less regularly since graduation. It seems to me this is uh, complimentary, about 70%, 68.6. Uh, I suspect this is pretty high. We worry about uh, so many people leaving the teaching profession, but uh, I suspect if you would ask at Rotary someday how many change their professions more than once, you'll be surprised how many hands will go up. And this is of doctors, lawyers, any other profession you can think of. You've got about five times the number of the respondents who are who stayed in teaching to those who did not. So I'd say this is very good. I think it's a compliment to the. <coughs> then they have a. So, you know, me, Charles, mm -hmm. was, uh, your comment reminded me that I remember when I was uh, here at Ball State as a student. Uh, if I'm not uh, um, fault in my recollection, <laughs> I think there was a period of time when we had to uh, sign a. Some kind of a form. I, I took it to be a kind of pledge that we would teach at least one year or more in the state of Indiana. Well, certainly on the basis of uh, the evidence uh, we have here from the uh, questionnaires a few people returned, we wouldn't have to worry much about that anymore because uh, a high, such a high percentage of people have taught, and most of them have taught in Indiana. Anyhow, that uh, that idea of signing that form was dropped after a period of time, and maybe it was dropped because someone found out that it really wasn't necessary. Of course, we have another incentive now. I don't know if you're here on your national defense uh, loans. If you if you teach, don't you get to not have to pay back half of it or something? Yeah, which is a type of an incentive to pay in the future. Uh, the reasons for uh, leaving the profession as to when they left, I mentioned the reasons as to when after one two three four or five years uh, it varies there were 213 that answered this question 22 percent 16 32 so well, i don't think this is too important because uh, uh it was followed up by the next question my reason for having uh, left the teaching profession was uh, and you guessed it what heads the list is my number one problem marriage and pregnancy <laughs> In far as teaching personnel is concerned, so uh, I don't. It doesn't seem. I think this is a normal, logical, uh, biological process. In that order too. <laughs> uh, we don't want to do away with it. Although there are times I'd like to delay some of these things to keep teachers teaching a little bit, three or four years instead of one or two. <laughs> We should uh, point out, too, that the marriage and pregnancy came in that order. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Virtually, though, uh, so many students get married now before they complete their college uh, work. And I can remember so clearly when I was taking a course in adolescent psychology with Dr. Heidel that one day he asked the question if there was any married person in the room. Well, I was sitting somewhere up towards the front, I remember, and all of us turned around to look. It was a class of about 30 or 35, and there was one person, a girl, in the back of the room who raised her hand. And I remember we all looked at her as though she were some kind of freak because we just hadn't realized that anybody would be married and still be in college. My goodness, how things have changed. <laughs> <laughs> now it's almost the other way. <coughs> I probably ought to admit it this time, uh, Collins, I was married my last two years in college, too. Good for you. <laughs> they used to give me more newspaper space for being the only member of the football team married than anything I ever did. <laughs> that was an indication that you could carry increased responsibility. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, the other question on the assignment that I have on teacher preparation, uh, on re-entering the teaching profession, and uh, about half out of the number that answered this question resumed the profession after, uh, later in life after family responsibilities had subsided. Naturally, this is 
many fine teachers, mothers that we have coming back into the profession now after their children have grown or at least are in school. Uh, <clears throat> teacher preparation, your major function as an institution, and I would hope it'll be the major function as a university. I've had my say. Mm -hmm. According to that 27, uh, where you find 50 percent of the people who come back into teaching, that says to you all you have to use be patient. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Collins, you talk to us a little bit about uh, the academic major and what the students thought about that. The I'll alumni thought about that. I'll be glad to. Uh, I want to comment on a point that uh, Edward made when he was talking about um, his children, and he mentioned he had his daughter here at Ball State. He was more successful than I because um, I talked about it to my two children, and they never came right out and said plainly why uh, they didn't want to come to Ball State. But I, from what they did say, I got the implication that, that they thought one catastrophe had been enough, <laughs> and there was no reason to compound it. Uh, so I wasn't successful. Uh, uh, well, Collins, I convinced my daughter that 30 years was enough time they'd never know the old man anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, Ball State is much larger in enrollment now, so uh, uh, that would even make it even more difficult to find out about the father. Um, well, anyhow, let's take a look at the academic major. <clears throat> there were about 30 items under this category. And uh, you could guess, I'm sure, how you responded uh, to these items. Um, the most uh, popular major was elementary education. There were 152 out of 655 who had had that for their major. And uh, others that seemed to be um, uh, heavy in popularity or choice, 82 in business education, there were 55 in English, 41 in Home Economics, 35 in Industrial Arts, 28 Mathematics, 52 Social Science, 51 Physical Education, and then uh, the others had a smaller number indicated. Now, I don't know whether that uh, same kind of spread would uh, show up on a larger sample or not, but maybe we could assume it would be fairly representative. And uh, to this item, I want to relate another item over in another section, and then I won't talk about it when I come to that section. The other question is, if you had it to do over again uh, and could change your major, what would that new major be? Well, it's rather interesting that uh, most people uh, seem to indicate they wouldn't make much of a change. Um, about 34 people said they would uh, take elementary education if they were starting in a fall state again. And 26 said they would go into business administration. Now, incidentally, on that item, 29 indicated their major was business administration, and 26 said they would do it. They would go into that major as starting over again. And uh, it's my um, assumption that major is not too old. So maybe even though the number is small, uh, there's an indication for us that there may be quite a bit of interest in the area of business administration, um, which is a little different from business education, another item on the list. But uh, actually, uh, there, there does not seem to be a great deal of dissatisfaction or unhappiness on the part of most of these uh, people, uh, because they would uh, do just about the same thing over again. Uh, I don't know how that uh, would strike our group here this afternoon. I've asked myself that question, uh, what would I do if I were doing it over again? And I, Everett and Fred and others, I suppose, have done the same thing. And uh, my answer is about the same as uh, I found here on these results. I'd do about the same thing. Uh, I had a major in social science and either a minor or a major in English. And I can't, I haven't been able to think of any reason for making a change. Um, I did indicate I would. Uh, take more psychology courses. Um, I took, I think, all there were at the time, and that leads into another point, about 28 people, or no, I guess it's a percent, isn't it, in the blue figure on the right. This is, this is percent, isn't it? That's your numbers. No, this is numbers. Yeah, I want to be sure. Yeah, 28 people indicated um, that if they were coming back to 
start over again, they would have a major in psychology. And uh, either we don't have that as a major area yet at Ball State, or um, we're just about the point of moving into it. But anyhow, there's another indication that uh, a number of people seem to be interested in that area. Well, I don't uh, think of anything else that, would, that you'd want to know about there. Now, uh, section five, you want me to go ahead with that? Yes. Yeah. Section five, uh, if you had to do, if you had it to do over again, um, I don't know whether people interpret that to mean or would you get married again or would you uh, go back to college or what? By the way, Everett, uh, you or somebody said a while ago that every time you come back to Ball State, you learn something new. Well, I remember your comments uh, to me. Uh, uh, you said that I uh, hadn't changed much. I, I had a, I had a paunch or a pot. I don't know how you referred to it. I had a pot and I'd lost most of my hair. Well, actually, I'm I not very articulate, am I? <laughs> um, well, I, I say uh, you, you get to the point quickly. <laughs> um, well, anyhow, if you had it to do over again, and there are some interesting items here, and I'll just comment briefly about them. For the most part, um, as we've already indicated, the, the, the people who responded said, yes, I'd, I'd take the same major. 320, now it's 655, that's almost half. I'd take the same major over. 228 said probably, I'd take the same thing. 71 said probably not, and only 34 said definitely not. So uh, here again, uh, is this an indication that um, uh, Ball State did a good job for us? Uh, or on the other hand, is it an indication that um, Ball State didn't cause us to uh, change our thinking and our attitudes and our career choice enough that when we got out into the world, we found that we had been short-cutted in some way, and we wished that we could have had a new area that we didn't have, and if we were coming back, we'd take a different area. I don't know. Maybe this is another indication of uh, self-satisfaction, uh, conservatism, I don't know. Whatever it is, I'm a part of it. Um, another item, this is a, I think this is an important item. Uh, if you had to do over again and would pursue the same major, list the factors that influence this decision. In other words, why would you take the same major over? And the, there were seven items, uh, and you were to go down in descending order of importance. Well, 441, that'd be about two-thirds, I guess. Uh, the area of my college major has been of lifelong interest to me. The second reason for taking the same major over, my courses generated a genuine sense of intellectual curiosity. And the third, I won't mention all these, the third one, I had very fine instructors in my college major. And another one, my work laid a foundation for future study on my own. And uh, still another very important one, 352, answered this, uh, uh, gave it a uh, high ranking. Vocational opportunities have been very good. Here again is a tie-in between the kind of major area that we took here at Ball State and then how we related it uh, to a career when we left the college. I suppose uh, some liberal arts critics would um, point out that that's a negative indication that um, we uh, were too vocationally minded and our major was too close to the vocational area that we were going to follow when we left Ball State. Well, I suppose a case could be made for that. Uh, of course, that gets into dangerous ground because uh, when you raise the question where are the liberal arts colleges. Mm. Then you get the kind of answer that uh, Dr. McGrath at Teachers College came up with when he made his study, and he found only one, only one truly liberal arts college in the United States, St. John's, Annapolis, Maryland. Now the answer will have to be two, because uh, starting next fall, St. John's of Santa Fe will open in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and it is a counterpart of St. John's of Annapolis, Maryland. And most of the liberal arts colleges, as you folks know, 
are heavily engaged in pre-vocational and pre-professional work. I know I've visited a group of 20 colleges in Ohio during the last year, most of them liberal arts colleges, and sometimes just to be kind of mean, I ask the question, well, um, I know you're a liberal arts college, uh, do you do anything else? Uh, do you have any graduates in teacher education? And usually the answer is, oh, it ranges from 40% to 60% of our graduates are in teacher education, but it's still liberal arts. Now on the other side of the fence, um, I remember uh, President Emmons and I uh, recently did a, an end case visit to a college in another state, and just the opposite thing occurred. This college is, is really one of the great teachers' colleges and has been for many years in the United States. And um, um, so we were inquiring around, and we found that a number of their graduates, not a large number, but a fairly decent-sized number, were not in teacher education. They were in liberal arts. And so we made enough of that point that finally the president said, oh, well, yes, that's true. We do have some students in liberal arts. But we're known as a teacher's college, and we just haven't wanted to say anything about the liberal arts students. That was kind of a curious thing. Well, um, another item. If, in retrospect, you would change academic direction, please indicate the reason. And there were nine different reasons here. Um, 33 um, said, my major field had no application. These must have been the liberal arts people. Uh, Sixty of them said that uh, the major courses seemed too theoretical and too abstract. Eighty said many courses were too shallow in treatment. You have to remember this uh, sample that we're talking about was 655. Seventy-two said the major courses, the major course was chosen before mature consideration and large number of hours required in other majors uh, precluded a change in majors. In other words, they might have changed to something else, but it was too late. 63 said, the major that I now prefer was not offered when I attended Ball State. And I suppose uh, 28 of that group of 63 may have indicated psychology, which was not a major uh, back in the um, early days. Now let's see. If you would again choose Ball State for your college education, check the one statement below that would best summarize the reason why. Now, I think this is an important point. Uh, if you were thinking of Ball State again, why? What would be your best reason? Well, 281 said, Ball State offers a good education at a reasonable cost. Now, there are, there are two important points tied together, quality and cost, reasonable cost. 186 said, I think Ball State is an excellent college. 115, I have no complaints about Ball State. It gives one all one can reasonably expect from a college. Uh, another item, uh, this is my last item, I think. If you would not choose Ball State again as your institution, check the one statement that would best summarize your reason. Well, obviously, if so many of them would have chosen it again, we're not going to find a very large number for any of these items, and that's the way it turns out. Uh, the largest number, 72, had to be grouped under other reasons other than those listed here, and I don't know what those other reasons were, a whole miscellaneous bunch probably. 22 said, the course I took at Ball State had little relevance to my professional preparation in my life. Uh, 18 said, there was little opportunity for independent work at Ball State. Well, I don't know about that one. It seemed to me that uh, most of the professors I had not only thought of reasons why I should work hard, but they thought a lot of their own. And I can remember uh, uh, some of uh, the people, my uh, associates and friends in my class, and maybe a year ahead of me, Tom Hastings was one of them, seemed to me that uh, he did a lot of independent work uh, over at the Pine Shelf and a uh, <laughs> uh, number of other places. Uh, I was always amazed that he could organize his time so well to get everything done so well. But uh, certainly uh, he had quite a bit of independence in his work. Um, well, anyhow, um, 18 more said Ball State offered very little intellectual challenge to me. 
Well, I think in summarizing that section, I'd say that for the most part, the um, alumni of Ball State are saying that um, they felt pretty good um, in terms of uh, how their expectations were met uh, here at Ball State. And if they were doing their life over, starting college over, they'd come back. They'd take about the same major as they had before, and they, uh, they would feel that they were getting a quality education at a fairly reasonable cost, and um, so they wouldn't see too much reason to bring about much change. I think I'll pass on that. Very good. Thank you, Colin. Eric, uh, would you take a swing at these next questions that have to do with how you rate in Ball State? Yes, I think this is uh, it'll be very interesting to you and uh, con shows considerable intestinal fortitude on the part of the President the Alumni Association to ask the question. <laughs> uh, one, from your best estimates, how do you how does Ball State education compare with the education received by the majority of your friends who attend schools in each of the categories below? <coughs> Private and church-related colleges and universities. What would your answer be? This is what they said was said on the questionnaire. Almost 45% rated Ball State superior. And another 40 three percent about the same so eighty seven point five percent of the people that answered and there were six hundred and twenty two answers said the, the same or better other state colleges or just state colleges is the next question now that, keep in mind you're rating ball state <clears throat> forty percent plus rated superior, 59% about the same, 8 tenths of 1% inferior. Incidentally, that must have been one of those seven that didn't get his diploma. <laughs> <coughs> Other state, or no, state universities, 70% uh, <coughs> are 86.4% say about the same or, or superior, but the superior is uh, about 17 percent, about 13 rated Ball State teachers as being inferior to state universities. I would say this is uh, highly complimentary. And may I yeah, ask you a question, Everett? Um, the responses here somewhat surprise me, and I'm not sure I understand them. One way. I believe to interpret this is that uh, typically the Ball State alumnus may feel very strongly that his institution has provided a better education than, let's say, Harvard or Princeton, uh, much better, but uh, not so much better than the University of Mississippi. Uh, well, uh, uh, I would guess uh, that. Uh, when we when that they're really comparing with it says majority uh, with education received by the majority of your friends who attend uh, in the categories below since yeah. the majority of our graduates are Indiana people I suppose the majority of their friends went to Indiana colleges I would think this is more of a comparison with your church related private colleges in Indiana and your state colleges and universities rather than across mm -hmm. the nation well, I'm, I'm sure that's right. My example was an extreme. Yeah. But another implication is that uh, uh, it is also a saying that uh, Ball State has provided a better education than those institutions which can be selective in their admission. Better or at least as good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, majority is either as good or better, yeah. 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 Uh, oh, I just thought yeah. of something. All right. You know, uh, Fred's point raises an interesting uh, um, series of ideas. Uh, this whole business of selection of students at the point of admission. Uh, the assumption is, of course, that the tighter, the more competitive admission standards that you have, the better quality of student that you get. And I suppose there's something in that. 
but um, uh, it's interesting to note that on our campus, in the last three Septembers, 65% or more of our entering freshmen on the Columbus campus, not counting the branch centers, have been from the upper third of their high school class. This last September, 68%. And yet, curiously enough, the percentage of dismissals is the same as it was four years ago. Now, uh, our president has been very much concerned about this because he's made the point that he actually thinks that if we get to the point where we take only the students from the upper third of their high school class, it's very possible the percentage of dismissals would still be the same. And this, of course, uh, causes a lot of uh, speculation. Uh, well, anyhow. Collins, uh, <coughs> it seems to me that uh, that one of the main reasons for this, and I, this I sincerely believe, is the inability to direct self and the the inability to direct yourself in study habits and to use the freedom that college life gives you as compared with home and secondary school not the mental ability more kids flunk out of college because the inability to direct their day plan their time uh, than because of the inability to get the academic subject Ms. Collins yeah. is talking about a point that has to do with the faculty and the faculty's attitude toward the students they have. And I think he's saying that uh, given five categories, A through F, the faculty is applying these five categories to the students they have without a great deal of reference to the total population. Mm -hmm. And uh, concurrently, perhaps the faculty uh, upgrades its expectations as it acquires a more able yeah. student body and ends up with uh, the old normal curve of the yeah. same number of A's and F's. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, isn't it true that uh, your selective admissions, when, it, when we became uh, cognizant of it and was doing more of it here in the past, I mean, the past 15 years, it was primarily academic. But aren't we now looking for something besides academic attainment? Aren't we more concerned with the psychological adjustment, the part of the country, the type of home, a lot of these things? Yeah. That is, your, your real selective institutions yeah. are doing more of the total selection rather than just the academic selection. That's right. Well, uh, the next, uh, this is a good one. <coughs> Would you please rate the relative strengths and weaknesses of Ball State as they compare to colleges and universities that you know. Again, uh, I would guess that the majority of them that answer know more about Midwest colleges, and particularly Indiana colleges and universities, rather than the Eastern Seaboard or Western Seaboard. Uh, for career training, 88.5% rate this is one of Ball State's strength. Development of a well-rounded individual, about 80%. Rate this as a strength. A challenging intellectual program. Here, 60, 40, 60% rated as a strength. Uh, the uh, appreciation of spiritual life. Here's something we talked about quite a bit. About 61.4% rate this as a weakness. Appreciation of the spiritual life. We, uh, as the, the panel, uh, raised this question. <coughs> Perhaps, <coughs> as we analyze the community from which students, the majority of students over the past 15 years or so and longer, have come to this institution, they come from a uh, rural community, small community, small home, small town, and uh, uh, perhaps they relate the freedom of college and the fact they don't have to participate spiritually in weekly services and so forth to the fact they did at home. But uh, whatever, uh, this is something perhaps uh, the, uh, the college folks may want to look into. 
maybe this has to do also, uh, I don't know whether, whether the hell of baloo about the separation of church and state that you've been reading about in the last year and a half, whether this might have an influence on that kind of a answer or not. <clears throat> the opportunity to examine politically, social, and moral questions. 55% rate this as a strength, over half. <clears throat> the opportunity to acquire social polish, polish, confidence, and poise. 60-40 again, 60% rate as a strength. The opportunity for contact with more than, with more sophisticated, more a, uh, with a more sophisticated group of people. And uh, about 64% say that this is a, a, a strength or a weakness. I guess they think we teachers aren't too sophisticated. Everett, you know, I was relating that to my thinking uh, when uh, Fred was talking earlier about uh, the alumni response that Ball State could be an outstanding institution and serve the nation as a whole. So they don't add up quite, do they? Well, uh, perhaps they're expressing a yeah. the same idea. Yeah. They hope yeah. that it would in the future. Yeah. I wonder what the uh, what the meaning sophisticated had for uh, whoever designed the question there and, and the people who responded to it. I can't remember now. Can you answer that, Linson? <laughs> <laughs> I always thought it was city slicker kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember that I got the notion that uh, sophisticated would apply to the person, at least when I was here in college, who wanted to smoke but couldn't on the campus, so he went across the street to the pine shop. <laughs> <laughs> How about the fellow who used to leave his cigar, cigar butts on the curb and then take him up when he come back? <laughs> he was just showing the effects of the depression. <laughs> <clears throat> well, we'll continue here. Number eight, marriage opportunities. My daughters don't think this is too good a place. <clears throat> but uh, the alumni think it's 68.8%. Uh, so I think it's real good for that. I think a good many of these folks met their wives or husbands here. In other words, you rate high. Opportunities to develop an appreciation of culture and the finer things of life. Uh, there's, there's not a, they certainly don't associate culture and sophistication together. Mm -hmm. Here it's 75.9%. So this is a good place. <clears throat> International outlook. Again, uh, and I think this gives some validity to what Dean Burkhardt just said, 63% consider this a weakness. Uh, the, uh, another question that you uh, might be interested in, particularly using the rating scale on the right, would you please grade the following aspects of a college? Uh, here we had 652, and they asked quality of fact, fact, uh, faculty. And uh, you, you folks did real well. Um, average or above, uh, 90 some percent. Superior, 13 and a half, 13.5. Above average, 53. Average, 27. So above average, and superior, 67%. I'd say it's pretty complimentary. Quality of administration. We're going to rate Jack Evans here now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 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 he come out well, too. <laughs> uh, 20, uh, superior, 20%, 20 20.6. Above average, 48.6. 23.6. Administration fooled a lot of people for a long time. <laughs> Quality of library. Uh, again, average or above average. Let's see, 91%. Average or above average, and the average was 24%. Quality of personnel service. Personnel service. In this area, the superior was down to only 9, 10%, above average about 33, and average 
42. So it looks like, uh, yeah, 81, 82 average or above, but about half and half above average and average. Uh, of the group of all these things, of all these uh, six or seven things that I'm reading, this is, has the highest percentage of just average. Just average. This is something the uh, college folks certainly want. Appearance of buildings and grounds. Uh, oh, 96.4% average or above, and 86. Seven, eighty-seven percent of that is above average or superior. You don't have to give your buildings and grounds people a pat on the back. This is what they think of your buildings and grounds. Uh, college relationship with surrounding community. Again, uh, average and above average combined amount to about ninety percent. And the attractiveness of surrounding community. Uh, this is not so high, but about 80-some percent average or above. Do you think that the attitudes of the Ball State faculty members were, number one, very conservative, two, conservative, three, middle of the road, so on, liberal, very liberal, other? <coughs> uh, I see a few people on the edge of their chair. I want to hear this. <laughs> Uh, very conservative, 1.8 percent. There were 652 that answered this question. Uh, conservative, 21.5 percent. Middle of the roaders, 45.9. Liberal, 22.2. Very liberal, 3.4. And I don't know what that was. <laughs> uh, this is uh, 51 as the uh, number of this last question. Uh, how much did your experience at Ball State contribute to your cultural development? And uh, I think this is an in, uh, is a indication of the uh, fact that they think well of their college. 43% helped substantially, 40% somewhat, only 15 made little difference but less than 1% say it hindered it. Again, that's some of, one of those seven didn't get the diploma. Yeah, probably so. <laughs> Dean, I about go through that. All right, thank you, Everett. Uh, Fred, would you take us through these questions on uh, what's been happening to our graduates since graduation? Yes, just two or three items which I think can be treated rather quickly. Um, on a question as to what uh, life activities uh, uh, do you find give you the most satisfaction? Uh, the order of those suggested, the rank order is probably about as you would expect. Uh, uh, preponderant group, 64% found the career or occupation to give the greatest satisfaction. And then well down after that percentage comes association with friends. Now, the first of these two, career or occupation, of course, is literally related to one's college education. The second association with friends is implicitly, since I suppose one tends to find friends among those who have had similar experiences. And then after that, uh, with related uh, almost equal percentages, marriage and family, uh, leisure time activities, literature, art, music rather low on the scale, uh, particularly uh, in contrast to noting that in an earlier question, uh, Ball State graduates found this perhaps to be one of Ball State's weaknesses, its lack of appreciation of spiritual life. Uh, perhaps uh, as uh, the panel here has indicated, they came to college with uh, uh, something of a religious background, perhaps did not have uh, strong experiences during college, and this again I suppose we would relate to the separation of church and state principally, and as a consequence perhaps do not follow through with much religious experience, 
or at least you're not find this very satisfying, very satisfying. Of course, it could be like spinach, too. <laughs> mm. yeah. It'd be good for everybody else and not necessarily good for me. Right. And then uh, community affairs, interestingly, ranks rather low. And it has often been my experience, and uh, it's a thing that has concerned me, that uh, uh, teachers do not seem much involved with community affairs wherever I've been. They teach about it, they teach about citizen responsibility, but uh, you don't see them on the board of the Red Cross or uh, volunteer workers and this and that thing very often. They feel they have a full life serving youth in their profession, and I can understand that uh, community affairs is ranked quite low. And the very last item is the one I alluded to before, participation in study groups. Not much satisfaction is found from that. Now, one of the more intriguing pieces of information here is uh, digging into how much money you make. And uh, you were asked to indicate your income last year, ranging from no income through uh, about 10 or 11 steps to $20,000 and over, and also uh, the income of your wife, or spouse, rather. And uh, I understand that all of this information about income of all alumni is on file in Bob Linson's office, and that anyone who subscribes more than $100 a year has free access to that <laughs> file. <laughs> Um, I don't know the median income, the, the mode, the most popular income level was uh, $5,000 to $7,000, uh, quite a broad range. 28% of the respondents found themselves in that group, the highest percentage. And uh, among the spouses, it was also the highest. 22.9% of spouses were in that income range. Uh, which means, in effect, we would double that, you see, for family income for those who did have two incomes. 14% uh, had no income, and uh, I presume these are housewives for the most part, and among spouses, 20% had no income. Well, then, under $1,000, a very small figure, 3.9, rising to the uh, figure I mentioned five to seven thousand, then in descending order, rather sharply, uh, seven to eight thousand drops from the twenty-eight percent I mentioned down to ten percent, and descending order, uh, twenty thousand over one point seven percent, or grouped a bit differently, if we view those. Nine thousand dollars and above, it accounts for eighteen percent of the respondents, twenty-one percent of the spouses, and I feel confident, though I don't have figures with me, that this represents uh, income uh, medians and distribution somewhat above national levels for all people. Now, one final question that. Uh, made an interesting stab at uh, the political points of view of respondents, and I think it's about uh, enough to say that uh, generally they turned out to be a fairly con conservative group, and the spouses were quite parallel. Uh, I suppose uh, they tended to think alike within a family. Uh, they might have been a little more conservative than many of us would have thought, it's interesting to, if we can label them rather conservative, it's interesting to speculate as to how uh, they get to be that way. That is, are they from uh, rural Republican tradition in Indiana? Uh, if so, how do we discount the number of students who have come from uh, uh, working families uh, who live in heavily uh, Democratic areas? Uh, Where I, are they in Indiana? Pardon? Where are those heavily democratic areas in Indiana? Well, they're in a part of the, they're in the southeast part of Muncie. Uh, they're in uh, <laughs> uh, they're in every city, and um, Indiana indeed is um, a Republican state in terms of voter registration. But 
uh, we so often also think of the youth as being the group uh, has not yet become this conservative perhaps uh, it comes with maturity and uh, the pots of all of us you referred to and uh, incidentally I think that accounts for the high percentage who feel one of Ball State's strengths is producing a well-rounded individual <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's interesting to compare that to this rather conservative bent among alumni with the views earlier described as to their view of the faculty which uh, put the faculty pretty much down the middle of the road in terms of conservative vis-a-vis -vis liberal uh, attitudes. Well, I think that sums up these facts. Uh, Dean? Dean, I'd like to say one uh, comment on this salary. I think you have to keep in mind when Fred said between five and seven thousand that the that fifty percent of these questions there were questionnaires were from people that have only been out that have been in, out of college a short time. Yeah. Less ten, less than ten years. Yeah. So if they are teaching, uh, this the if, if majority of them are still teachers, uh, yeah. around seven thousand dollars is as high as they've got up to. Quite significant. Yeah. Now I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to express our appreciation to Dr. David Rice of our Office of Research, who worked with Dr. Linson in uh, preparing these statistics for us to work with today. As he's already indicated, the uh, replies are still coming in, and it was quite a task to uh, get this much data arranged for you uh, even today. So uh, thanks to Dr. Rice. I think, Dean, we should say he really knows more about it than all of us put together. That's right. Well, how about that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> now, I said at the beginning that uh, we'd go through this quickly, and we found as we got into it that it was a little more fascinating uh, than perhaps we thought. I hope you thought it was interesting. And uh, ask these men to uh, reflect some on their own experiences, and they've been able to suggest some of that as they've gone along, talking about the strengths of the college as they saw it. But there are two other portions of the program. Uh, one is to ask them what they think the future directions of the college should be. <coughs> and the second is to give you that same opportunity. So may I turn back to the panel now and then no specific order particularly, just as you feel moved to speak. Uh, what would you men think are some of the directions that uh, we ought to take as we uh, move forward to the academic year 1964-65 and following? Well, uh, I'll venture a, a view or two. It seems to me that Ball State faces at once a great opportunity and a number of dilemmas, which undoubtedly it will resolve. Um, I have lived in eastern states, perhaps more than some of us, according to this questionnaire, and uh, it has been very interesting to me to observe what you already know, the rather low level of esteem with which a teacher's college is held in the East. Uh, it's, it's really rather amusing at times. Uh, I think there are ready explanations for it uh, in part. Uh, well, some states have so much of a profusion. Pennsylvania, 13 teacher's colleges, which meant that none of them really could grow very substantially uh, in trying to serve its little regional area. Uh, they are now going through the transition, of course, and then the East was uh, the beginning of uh, the traditional uh, kind of higher education in America, and still a fountainhead of it, and teacher training grew up uh, as a different kind of animal, not only in the East, but all over the United States. Now we find, over recent years, the strong trend to get rid of the teacher's college designation in state after state after state. Nobody wants to be known anymore as a teacher's college. Uh, within this picture then, Ball State has become one of the great teacher's colleges in quantity. I think uh, year after year it graduates, uh, it ranks second, third, first uh, as to the number of elementary school uh, teachers
teachers being graduated and in other respects as well. Uh, it is highly regarded throughout the nation. It has established a great reputation. Now, as it turns to become a university, I think it does face problems, but a kind of uh, dilemma in part I talk about is uh, the admission of students. Um, I think Everett has rightly said that we must provide uh, almost everyone the opportunity to fail. He has also said that we need the very best pe people in teaching. Well, we must agree with this. And it may be hard to fit these two things together. Uh, we do know that those institutions which uh, can be selective, the Reeds, the Knoxes, the Swarthmores, uh, um, do have in many respects a superior kind of student, which the institution cannot expect to have as a, as a standard within a student body when it must uh, admit all comers. So as Ball State moves into university status, and a medical school, a school of architecture, professional schools, a, a separate college of arts and sciences, I think it will find itself rather impelled toward um, uh, rising academic standards. And then it will have to face this question of its responsibility to the full citizenship of the state, to all the youth of the state. The point which seems to me especially pertinent and the future of Ball State is related to this question of the reputation of the Teachers College. Um, there is a strong movement in the nation, as you know, uh, concerned with accreditation of teacher education. And some new voices are being heard. People who have not been part of teacher accreditation are saying, uh, we have a view about this too. We have had nothing to do with it, but we think it might be done differently. There's currently a considerable turmoil in this whole area. Uh, and incidentally, not incidentally, but uh, I should want to add that Dr. Emmons uh, is a leader in representing Ball State and uh, the history of uh, accreditation uh, as we know it in this whole area. He, he ha is serving high positions of responsibility and you can be assured that Ball State and like institutions will be rep well represented. I, I talked yesterday on the phone briefly with Dr. Meyer who is conducting this major study under the auspices of AAAS on what has been the effect uh, of certification uh, procedures and standards on teacher education. No one really knows this yet, mm -hmm. so the question is being asked, what has been the effect? He says that he's about halfway through this study, uh, some 15 months, so a few months from now, I think we will have major announcements. We will have some answers to the questions that Dr. Conant has posed. Dr. Conant would uh, do away with virtually all certification. But it seems to me that in the future, the state departments of education are going to have much less authority uh, in prescribing uh, not only teacher certification, uh, teacher education curricula, and curricula of the uh, elementary and secondary schools than they have had in the past. I think we will begin to uh, uh, erase some of these state lines, and indeed you could uh, be certified as a teacher in one state uh, where you got your training and moved to another state and without having to take a course in the history of Nevada, uh, move into a school and teach. Uh, there, there will be a kind of matching up and agreement, and there will be new voices. And some of these new voices will be people from a uh, more strictly academic life. This may, in my view, have a good effect on uh, an institution like Ball State because it has always been so busy and the proper and prudent training of teachers that there has not been much time or money uh, to let a professor uh, rattle around in his laboratory and do what he would like to do there, uh, in effect discover knowledge. The teachers' colleges have not been discoverers of knowledge, they have been conveyors of knowledge. But
But they have had to depend upon the arts and science colleges, the great uh, universities and graduate schools, to develop the new knowledge. Now it seems to me, with Ball State turning to university status, it has a, an opportunity and a responsibility to have both working together. And I think uh, it will be a much more effective teaching and learning uh, program going on when it is also involved in the generation of new knowledge. A thought of two of mine. Mm -hmm. Very good. <coughs> well, then, um, it seems to me that uh, in any kind of an organization, the problem of size uh, goes right hand in hand with the problem of the administration and maintaining quality. I used to try to be a kid, manager of the school system with 1,300 enrollment. I'm now trying to manage one with 13,000. Well, uh, we have much more opportunity to do quality in the big, but we have much more opportunity to fail. And I believe the real problem of bigness is quality. And in, <coughs> in line with to continue on uh, Armstrong's thought, <coughs> uh, I'm not sure in teacher education, uh, in fact, I believe, I am sure that we have not been creative, we have not spent the percentage of our institutional dollar on research and development that practically any other business has to do to keep up. And uh, with the tremendous burst through of knowledge that we have, we've had in the last two and a half decades, now the problem <coughs> is not how much, because it's impossible to accumulate the facts. And he said this said, uh, uh, mentioned the fact that teachers' colleges have done have been just imparting knowledge, mm -hmm. a trade school, so to speak, to get ready to do this function, this trade. I believe <coughs> uh, the new frontier in this area is research and development in new techniques, the selection of personnel, uh, the whole field of educational media. We've, we haven't even scratched the surface. I would hope that the size of this institution would uh, allow it to uh, spend considerable mental power uh, in this whole area of research and development because I'm, con I'm convinced that if you will study what's happened even in secondary education in the last six, eight, ten years, you'll be amazed. We've been with it. We haven't seen the change. We haven't been cognizant of it. But what's going to happen the next ten, if we, if we do the job, uh, we can't even dream about now, next two decades. But I believe then this, uh, I would hope that one of the areas being that uh, Ball State could uh, spend a lot of time and effort on power and money, brain power and money, is the development of new techniques in the selection of people and then in the uh, development of new techniques and method and the presentation of subject matter content. Are you talking in favor of uh, moving uh, to university status or yes. against such a move? I'm in favor of it. It was said recently. Uh, in support of what Everett says at the meeting of the Association for Higher Education in Chicago, that um, the only industry, in quotes, that has been more backward in expenditure of funds for research and development than the railroad industry is the education yeah. industry. And that, uh, indeed, to carry the analogy further, had there been something of this in the railroad industry in earlier years, they might indeed today be running the airlines. And I am so sure no, none of us would want our 707 driven by most of the engineers that uh, we know. And there's no room for a feather bed? You know, uh, um, I um, don't really know how I think about this point. Uh, I was 
misled, really, because uh, most Fred never sort of move things along, and I thought they were thinking one way, and then uh, I got lost when they started thinking another way, and maybe that's the way I feel. I don't know. Maybe I'm just on good one. Uh, I take it as an academic matter, anyhow, what we think about it today, because uh, it's been pretty well decided, hasn't it? So, uh, that there be a university? Yeah. You know. Well, I think we could say that's been said. Well, that's why I think it's just an academic matter if we haven't talked about it. But maybe out of our um, uh, discussion, and, and I'm sure uh, you folks have a lot of excellent ideas on this point, uh, one or two things occur to me. I, uh, I think most of us who answered the uh, questionnaire may have responded somewhat favorably in moving from college status to university status simply because uh, university status uh, has a certain aura about it that reflects uh, more prestige and credit to us. If that's why we uh, answered that way, I'm not sure that our response is a good criterion to use to uh, judge whether or not we should move from college to university status. It's uh, kind of the old um, hierarchy of going up the ladder. Uh, many two-year colleges, junior colleges, have started out, and then uh, after a few years, they want to move to a four-year college level so they can give a bachelor's degree. And I think it's honest to say that a number of those uh, colleges that have made that move would have been better off to have uh, kept their identity as first-class junior colleges because when they made the change, they became third-rate um, four-year colleges. Well, uh, I'm sure Wall State uh, could meet the challenge, but I think there are problems. You know, uh, Fred and Everett both commented on research. Well, um, no one dares knock research. That's just like talking against democracy or love or anything else that's very favored in our society. But uh, that area has complication because uh, Ball State has uh, established a great reputation as, a, as an excellent uh, uh, college for the preparation of outstanding uh, teachers. And when you move into university status, then you get caught in this whole academic web of research and publication. I'll mention consulting, too. That's in there. And somewhere down the line on the totem pole, you may find teaching. And then this gets into the whole ramification of a new ordering of loyalties, a reordering of loyalties on the part of many professors. It's my observation that in many universities, the first loyalty the professor has is not to students, not to the university, not to his department, but maybe to a national association identified as American Psychological Association or the American Sociological Association. So uh, this can become a, a kind of a dangerous twist that if students uh, get dropped down the totem pole very far, then Ball State will lose something that it's um, had for a long time. I'm not saying this will happen, but I'm saying this is a concern that I would have because invariably people in a university setting do become greatly concerned about research and publication. As a matter of fact, when you look at the professor culture of universities in America, you find three kinds, three subcultures. You find some who are called teaching professors, and they teach. Then you find a great many who are research professors, and they may do very little teaching. And then you find others who are consulting professors, and they may do little research and little teaching. But um, it's not uh, inaccurate to say that on uh, many university campuses, it's an exception rather than the rule for the freshman student or even the sophomore student to have a contact with anybody called an assistant professor. For the most part, he is taught by graduate teaching assistants working on PhD degrees. And as a matter of fact, in some of the remedial courses, I realize the University of Illinois doesn't have any remedial courses anymore. Uh, we still have them at our place, although we're going to get rid of them. Uh, in the teaching of those courses, it's not graduate teaching assistants working on PhDs, but rather seniors and juniors, undergraduate students who may be teaching sections of those courses. 
Now these are all a part of reality. And uh, I'm saying this is a concern. Uh, then you get to budget. Now when you get to university status, you have to have specialized faculty, specialized laboratories, library facilities, and of course a curriculum in which uh, uh, if you have uh, uh, five or six or eight or ten students in a class, uh, that's the way it ought to be if it's a specialized professional area. So this means more money. And um, the state of Indiana uh, and the board of trustees for Ball State uh, probably have thought about this matter very carefully. But if there isn't enough budget to support the concept of a university and all its ramifications, then that could be a problem. And I can tell you there's some universities who are already faced with that problem. And um, when you start thinking about a budget for a college of medicine or a school of architecture, you go into an outer space almost immediately in terms of the extent of that budget. Now, on the other hand, um, uh, I agree that a lot of these good things could happen too, and I'm in favor of those. It occurs to me that um, if um, uh, it were possible either to hold on to the uh, concept of an outstanding college or else develop uh, and extend what we've already uh, had as an image of Ball State over the years uh, in preparing uh, teachers for secondary schools and elementary schools, then if we could add another idea, which is still in the teaching area, that of uh, preparing well-qualified and effective college teachers and administrators. Um, some colleges are doing that. There's no reason why Ball State can't do it. And um, uh, this would make a great contribution because uh, it's just possible one of these days we'll have uh, teacher certification at the college level. And this would tie in very closely with uh, Ball State's uh, reputation in developing well-qualified people who can become certified to teach at the elementary and secondary level. So the development uh, of college teachers and administrators could uh, uh, become an important uh, part of the job. This wasn't referred to, I know, in, in the questionnaire, but I uh, just thought of it. So uh, I don't know where that leads us, but uh, that's one idea. Anyhow. Dean, uh, may I get on the other side and support the implication of what Collins has just said? <coughs> uh, certainly one of the things that uh, should go on in a teacher's college, and that is that every professor, every day, give a good demonstration. And as I think back in my college career, I can think of one or two that I believe did this and conscientiously. Uh, uh, planned to give an example of excellent classroom teaching and presentation of subject matter daily. But most PhDs <coughs> in our colleges today have had no teacher, no methods courses, or no teacher training. And most of them teach the way they were last taught, even to college freshmen. And they were last taught on a lecture, presentation, exam method. Uh, so there might be merit to uh, uh, be against becoming a university <coughs> because and maintain and strive for this high quality of uh, teacher preparation, <coughs> even better than our reputation now suggests that we we do. Uh, it seems to me that uh, that uh, education as such, <coughs> particularly public education, when we consider the time and effort, tax dollars, there is the general public interest of public education uh, since Sputnik has, I don't know how many times multiplied because they're spending millions upon millions and people are interested in this and they're interested in their youngsters and their ability to adjust to the space age. So uh, maybe, uh, and I'm sure, I'm sure all the profs around here and the administration and board <coughs> have given this uh, uh, a great deal of thought but, you know, one of the problems in our country, <coughs> seems to me, 
is our uh, lack uh, of respect for quality. Whether it's a youngster getting his lesson, or the teacher doing the teaching, or a carpenter building a house, or whatever it is. And probably uh, most important, and where <coughs> can we do more good than to set an example of quality in a classroom? You know, in some of these attitudes, and we, when we talk about quality in terms of not only our work, but our word, our integrity, our thought, uh, 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 more of this maybe is caught by example than is taught directly. So maybe we uh, ought to think about this being the best teacher's college in the country and not a university. That's a happy thought. Now you've uh, been uh, most receptive and attentive uh, to the presentation of the panel. And let's give you an opportunity to ask them some questions or to give a testimonial or uh, make a speech that you'd like to make about what you think the future of the institution is. <laughs> who would like, uh, like to have the first opportunity? Yes, sir. I'm going to ask questions, but that would require a response. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be a So I would like to rephrase it and make a statement. And the statement is the same thing. What's the Incidentally, that leads to a question uh, from Howard Armstrong's question. Um, has there been a survey of higher education made recently in Indiana? I probably ought to know, but I don't. Well, a survey of what? We have a survey every week. Well, I mean, uh, I mean a, <laughs> a, a comprehensive uh, uh, study of the uh, needs and problems of higher education in the whole state. Well, let me uh, turn the question into the audience and ask uh, Dr. Rice if he'd like to speak to this. It seems to me that he made a uh, study recently having to do with junior colleges. Would you like to speak to that, Dave? There was a powerful uh, analysis made of the two-year postdoctoral education all of them. And the study was limited to only 7,000 higher education. I think since that time, our legislature has had a subcommittee studying the problems of higher education. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Howard's uh, question and point related to that sort of thing, that unless there were other provisions for uh, uh, helping high school graduates get into some kind of post-high school education, such as a community college or at least a, a two-year college, that um, just going, just uh, the fact that Ball State's going from a college status to a university status may not help the situation in the state. In fact, it could be a handicap. Well, Fred referred to uh, the activities of the colleges in the state, private and public working together, and annually an analysis is made of the enrollment in the uh, 35 or 36 Indiana colleges and universities. And on the basis of this, uh, we all take another look at the uh, at the principle to which we adhere, namely that uh, it would be real nice if we could have 50% of the students in private institutions and 50% in public. And it does become more difficult to maintain that balance. So that uh, there is this kind of an analysis being made regularly. Then the four public institutions have uh, looked at the problem, and the two universities have decided to expand their offerings at the extension centers and have discussed uh, presenting a bill to the next legislature for the establishment of four four-year colleges. 
uh, along this general line. But somebody else out here now would like to ask a question or make a statement. Yes, sir. Well, I'm trying to get a moment that you're not going to talk to us. I believe, I suppose, the coming of the university. However, I think. Dr. Earl Johnson, also Executive Secretary of the Teacher Training Licensing Commission of the State of Indiana. Earl, would you like to respond to that? Well, I think that's a good question to ask, uh, but, uh, and uh, I don't think there's any question of what we're going to move in the direction of, and we have moved in the direction of uh, full-time student teaching, which is a move in the direction of uh, the mentioning, and I'm confident that uh, that uh, many of us would like to <coughs> see the internship for a year. Uh, some way we worked out so that we would have a close relationship with that person during that uh, first year of teaching. However, you're always faced with the problem of um, the cost uh, to uh, a student who really is anxious to get out and start earning. When Dr. Combs was here on the campus, he said to me, you had the money, but the one thing you would like to do that you're not now doing after the years in turn, that's the extent to work about the debt. You said money didn't make you do it. Now, uh, I think that's uh, really uh, a very good uh, point you've made, and I'm sure that it's a uh, direction we're going to go, but it's a good direction. So, I would like to say this while I'm on the feet, uh, in good part. I am real pleased to hear this expression that we must not uh, lose our mission and I 
I would like to say that one division of this university is going to be a teacher's college, and I was privileged to be one of the committee that saw to it that we did use that uh, function strongly in our organization. Right. Right. Let's take one more statement or question, comment. I move we adjourn. <laughs> well, you had a chance to oh, talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is there one more? I was reading the faces of the uh, people. Well, it is true that our <laughs> means are limited by our ends. Uh, if not, uh, may I, on your behalf, express appreciation to the members of this panel for their presentation this afternoon, to you, to you for having filled out the questionnaire, uh, to you for any uh, further ideas that you may have about the institution as it uh, moves ahead in, in the years that are ahead of us. Thank you all for coming.